Hi, I'm Guy Lawrence and you are listening to the Guy Lawrence podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to find out more and join me and come further down the rabbit hole, make sure you head back to guylawrence.com.au. Awesome guys, enjoy the show. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you. It's good to be here. Mate, if you were on an aeroplane and you sat next to a complete stranger and they asked you what you did for a living these days, what would you say? It's a great question. It's so diverse now. Uh, it probably would start now uh, because this is the current focus that I'm involved in is, is a film producer, which is not what I ever expected myself to be saying. And then I'd add to that uh, meditation teacher, coach uh, and, uh, and author. Yeah, fantastic. Well, you know, we, we've crossed paths many times over the years, Tom. And, uh, and I saw you getting behind and producing a movie. And I was like, oh, my God, that's huge. Like, that's no small task, you know, and it's a big decision. What, what drove you to go in this direction? You know, I was actually quite naive looking back over, you know, the last seven years since I had that idea. We had our, interestingly, we're talking about this, but we had our premiere of the film, our Australian premiere last night in Dendi Newtown at the cinemas, sold out, uh, which was great. And, uh, you know, it was quite a phenomenal experience to sort of just sit and assess, wow, this has been seven years from having an idea that I plucked out of the field of infinite possibility. And the idea was really part of a, a, another idea, which was I wanted to inspire a billion people to meditate daily through the Stillness Project. And to do that, we wanted to do it through a number of different modalities, which is online programs, retreats, speaking gigs, mm -hmm. books. And one of those modalities we wanted to create as an incentive and a motivation for people to meditate daily was through film, because film is such a great, powerful medium to show the power of something through personal story. And, um, and that's what we wanted to capture was personal stories, very diverse backgrounds, very moving and emotional that showed you that yes, regardless of what your background, you can actually have an alchemy or a chrysalis as we talk about in the film, like a caterpillar does with a butterfly through this medium called meditation and there's multiple mediums you can do that it's just the one that's the one one i wanted to focus on and i'm skilled in um and so that's what gave birth to the film got it got it and how was the film received last night must yeah have, you, it was, you must have been nervous sitting before you know going into it yeah you know it's, it, it's it's one of those films that will i guess polarize an audience you know it's a, a very differently made film it's a very different style as there's a meditation in there, there's binaural beats, there's animation, there's, um, you know, it moves around quite a lot between these different stories and futures. So it's not a traditional documentary. You're not going to get a lot of information as to why you should meditate. It's, uh, it's a journey that you kind of twists and turns and throws you around a bit and it opens your heart up. And if it's what we find is those people are very cerebral and very much looking for just information. They're kind of feeling a little mm -hmm. bit let down um but those people that kind of feel through their heart a lot more they're just completely blown open by it and and, and in in awe of it so um it was obviously last night being the opening night it was a lot of the choir we call it you know the the, the people that are into this sort of genre in this space so they really really uh resonated well with it and there's been some great reviews yeah beautiful congrats mate i um i read a quote on your website um from the director and i think it's, it's i think the film is a gorgeous coffee table book not a sensational paperback <laughs> so that kind of sums yeah, it's up very because, visual you know it's yeah. a very visual you know we, we put a lot of emphasis on it being experiential um so it's you know beautiful visuals beautiful sound amazing score amazing sound design and uh, some very intimately shot uh, moments of human life. Beautiful. Why call it the portal? Yeah, you know, it was originally called the stillness effect, uh, which I, I still, to some degree, really love that name uh, because it was the effect that stillness has on our lives. Um, and then we sort of played around with some other titles. Um, the portal represents two things. One is um, the individual experience of transcendence when we go through this uh, pathway in the process of meditation because meditation is really just the medium or the, the vehicle to take us through to a space that's beyond form and phenomenon yeah. and we go from form to formlessness from boundaries to boundarylessness uh from from uh impermanence to permanence 
And that's the experience of transcendence that happens in meditation. When we go into that infinite from finite to infinite and the portal is the process, which is meditation. But the portal is also representative of the macro, which is this transitional point that we're going through uh, for us as a species. And it really is a fork in the road that we're at and right now. And that portal on the other side of that really lives two very polar uh, experiences, possibilities. One is a very enlightened and beautiful and integrated and harmonious and unified experience for us as a species, not just as human species, but for our integration with other species on the planet as well, which we have really still exists in a very separate sort of idea of. Um, and the other option through that portal is really quite unpleasant, which I don't want to put too much attention on, but it doesn't all go well for humanity. Yeah. And many other species, which is, I think we're seeing 10,000 species at the moment get extinct every year on the planet. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, the, uh, I, I, love, I love the name of the portal and, and how you describe that then. And from my own personal experience, Tom, having those experiences and seeing life from a certain set of eyes for, for many years of how culture and my upbringing to my whole belief systems and everything of who I thought I was and how I interact with this world. And then almost life kind of pushing me in a direction that forced me to go through my own very own portal of transformation, mm -hmm. just like the butterfly yeah. effect, like you were saying earlier, you know, from a caterpillar going through the chrysalis to coming out and having a deeper sense of connection to everything and everyone and a lot more compassion. And, and once you have those experiences, you can't take it back. You can't change like, like you, it's, it's amazing. The, and the, 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 butter, the butterfly can't go back to being a caterpillar. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, just like what you're saying there, and I can so see what, you, what you're doing with this movie, it's a beautiful experience. And it'd be incredible to think what, I guess, civilization and, and us as humans on a planet would be if we all started to experience our own true potential and what it's like to actually go through something like that. Yeah, you know, um, Daniel Schmachtenberger, one of the gentlemen in the film, who's a futurist, and he specializes in looking a long way down the road into the future for humanity. Um, he, 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 he says in the film that he used to contemplate what life was like as, on an enlightened planet. But we had a discussion with him prior to him coming on the film when we were interviewing him for it. And, and he asked and invited us as makers of the project to invite our audience to start contemplating individually and potentially collectively as a body, as a group, what life might be like on an, on an enlightened planet. Because at the moment, no one currently, um, particularly collectively, is, 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 is drawing up a vision for that. And if we don't have a vision for it, if we don't contemplate what it looks like, if we don't have a design for it or a blueprint, we can't actually create it. We can't get there. And so because we're not looking for it, because we're not looking to design it, because we're not designing it, then it's very difficult for us to experience it. But if we start to contemplate it, we start to map it out and we start to visualize it, not just for our own self individually. What do I look like on an enlightened planet? What do I look like as an enlightened person? What do I act my actions? What are my emotional states? What are my relationships like? What is my relationship with money like? What is our banking system like? What is our education system like? What is our sporting system? Is there a sporting system on an enlightened planet? Why are we still in these win-lose paradigms? And all of a sudden you start to get a North Star. And a, yeah. and a direction that can start to give you a roadmap as to, oh, this is where we need to go now. Yeah, totally. And it's about taking our attention off the, the, the things that are holding us back in life and being that future focused. Yeah. You know, you, if you look at where most of our attention goes, it's on Trump and Biden. It's on what's happening in Turkey and Syria. It's on, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the massive debt bubble that's being created. We're looking at past and current <laughs> present day you know, catastrophe, disaster, low grade, mediocre type of stuff. We're not really forecasting and looking forward to something that we've never seen and created before because we don't know what it looks like. So that's the hard thing about it. Yeah, totally. And within the movie as well, um, I believe, because I haven't seen it yet, but I believe you focused around uh, six people and their journeys and their stories. Yeah. The central theme of the film is the six personal stories of transformation. And, um, <clears throat> you'll get to see the film on December the 5th 
at Palace Cinemas in New, in uh, Byron Bay. So there's a short plug. <laughs> I'd be um, there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, what we really wanted to do was not to lecture people, not to give people a whole swathe of information. We wanted to take them on a, a journey on a path with some other people that have walked that path. And we didn't want to take monks from monasteries that had lived a blessed out life from the age of seven. Yeah. We wanted to showcase people that were in drug dens, that were in crises, were in abusive relationships, that had incredibly poor and challenging childhoods. And so, um, yeah, and, and, and had, have had crisis in their lives in some way, shape or form. And when, when you showcase the power of meditation in those situations, and the contrast of what it can do, it's like, oh, that, that includes me now. And so rather than it being exclusive, it becomes inclusive and it, it invites the audience to start to ponder what life might be like for them if they start to practice something like that on a daily basis. Totally, yeah. How, how did you go around about selecting the six for the movie? That would have been quite a task, wouldn't it? Yeah, it was a phenomenal task. You know, we, um, you know thank goodness for Google. Um, <laughs> that we, we researched 300 individual stories. That was an interview for each, each story. And that's, uh, you know, you're talking about a, a, almost an hour interview for each story and then yeah. you do follow-ups and then, you know, the, the stories had to have three components, four components really to them. One component was they had to have a crisis in there, um, some challenge, some difficulty, some struggle. Um, they had to have obviously meditation as the central practice that helped them get through that crisis. Um, because, you know, there's so many different mediums to get people through crisis, but we were focusing on meditation. Um, they had to have a global theme. So we're talking about, you know, Vietnamese refugees, US soldiers, um, United Nations, human rights lawyers, people, you know, people that had qualified for the Olympics. So very sort of macro theme. So it was embraceive of global stories um, yeah. and it didn't exclude people from that as well. And then, um, and, and then I guess the, the final one that we wanted it to really have to land was that it you know we had some such beautiful epic stories but they had to resonate with the audience you know that the character you know there had to be something about them the way they spoke and the their personality and that that would have some appeal you know we had one story it was a phenomenal story it was we were really really excited by it when we got to interview the the person for it and you know their response to questions was ah oh, yeah nah nah yeah. or maybe i don't know maybe and it was just like oh no the story's so good but there was just no level of eloquence and engagement so that was obviously just you know didn't qualify yeah fair enough and um do you mind touch it can we uh, without giving too much of the movie away because uh, you know without the spoilers or anything but c can we touch on the stories a little bit sure, of the, the six yeah. people and go 100%. through them because I'm, I'm intrigued to know what's been going on in their lives and, and what happened. Yeah. So we've got Buddha, who's an amazing, it's B-O-O-D-A. That's his nickname. He was a U.S. soldier in Afghanistan and um, Iraq. And uh, he's an amazing, beautiful man. And he suffered from PTSD in a very, okay. very severe way. And uh, he ended up going to the veterans clinic in uh, Augusta where he learned to meditate. And that was completely life changing for him. Nothing else would, you know, the drugs, the pharmaceuticals, psychologists, nothing was getting him through it. It was just getting worse until he learned meditation. Um, we have a Vietnamese refugee, Zui, who her name's Zui, which is written D-U-E. And, uh, you know, she, she grew up in a very, very violent and very poor area of Philadelphia after arriving, you know, as a one-year-old in, in the USA and um, was incredibly gifted intelligent wise and became uh, a Harvard, she won a Harvard scholarship, which she thought was going to be a ticket out of the ghetto, but it ended up being a crisis moment for her where she nearly sort of committed suicide and had a very deep, dark depression mm -hmm. and anxiety because the, it was like going into onto another planet from, you know, being in the hoods and ghettos of Philadelphia to being in some of the most elite environments and people and feeling a complete sense of disconnect and pressure. Um, and that's when she, you know, meditation helped her through her journey. Uh, we've got a Jewish rabbi that had a stroke locked in syndrome, which meant he could only move his eyes. Um, but he's probably one of the most enlightened people we've ever met. Uh, wow. And, you know, obviously meditation. He was a very spiritual person before that. He was one of the senior rabbis in the Jewish community in Montreal. But it was a real opportunity for him to embody his practice where the only thing left for him was meditation. And I've never met such a blissed out, enlightened person 
who's lost the greatest asset we could ever possibly want, which is our body. How is he um, communicating with you? He, 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 in the film, uh, he communicates, he can speak now. He wasn't able to okay. speak initially. He can only use his eyelids to blink, one for yes, two for no. Um, so he can hear, but he couldn't use his body. But now as he's developing and developing, he believes he can actually eventually get back through the power of the mind and the body. But he can now speak, which is great. Incredible. Yeah, some other stories. Heather, US track athlete, she just uh, won the nationals and was going to the Olympics, won scholarships to some of the top universities, broke her back three weeks later, jumping off a cliff. Um, you know, there's some phenomenal stories in there. Uh, who else have we got? We've got Doty, Jim Doty, who lost a, a ton of money in the tech crash. And Amandine is the United Nations human rights lawyer who suffered immense PTSD and trauma from being working with the UN in Afghanistan and Syria and, um, and Africa and uh, end up turning to meditation, end up becoming a yoga meditation teacher after seeing the power of it in the, uh, in the camps. Yeah, incredible. All the amazing ambassadors. It's interesting. Um, I didn't realize you had James Doty on, um, in there because I, I interviewed James a few years back. Oh, wow. Okay. When, uh, yeah, with his book, Into the Magic Shop. And, um, yeah, he's a phenomenal yeah. man. Beautiful man. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it was yeah. Uh, it was excellent. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, the next question I wanted to ask you was because what fascinates me about this work, Tom, is that, um, and this was my belief before uh, I sort of started delving into it myself, was that I uh, I'm not meditation. Uh, I'm not in a crisis. I don't need to go and do that. I'll I'll wait. I mean, what are your thoughts on why we tend to wait? before a crisis happens, before we start looking at this work, when my belief is now is that if we were all doing it anyway, life would just get so much more better. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, we don't need a crisis to be the catalyst for change. Generally, we do, but we don't need to. So interestingly, um, the crisis is really a, a technique or it's not a technique, it's a device used by evolution or nature or God or the divine, whatever you want to call it, to to create realignment. That's what crisis mm. is. Whether it's personal, planetary, company-wise, relationship-wise, it's a, it's a mechanism of evolution that is the catalyst for change when the process of change has become resistant. So if we're not growing, if we're not evolving, if we're not increasing our consciousness, if we're not increasing our level of awareness, if we're in a static plateau, if we're, you know, as a company, as a relationship, if we're just not growing and evolving then um then you're defying trying to defy the law of evolution which insists you must grow and must change must evolve and if you're not then what happens is the universe says hey we've got one over here bob that's kind of not not evolving we need to give them a little bit of a shake up um i'll send a few messages their way you know some karmic consequences shiva the destructive operator to come in and try and give them a few. So for me personally, if we translate to my story, you know, I started getting, uh, doing lots of drugs and drinking and partying, getting lost in the sensory world of deprivation and just sensory desire and, you know, all that sort of stuff as a broker. And the universe is saying, oh, we've got one here that's not really evolving. He's kind of trapped in this world of illusion that drinking and taking drugs is going to be the pathway to enlightenment or fulfillment or whatever. So you start getting these, these cues, these symptoms, signals, which is maybe anxiety or insomnia or something that's some discomfort. And that suffering is the catalyst for change. But if we resist suffering, then the suffering has to increase. It doesn't just drop off. And so the universe is always as a maternal guiding mechanism looking to support and nourish you to wake up and realize fundamental truth. Um, and if we resist this process, then the universe is there as a beautiful, loving parent that's going to corral you and guide you. And some of that they have to use is discomfort, just as if we've got a child in our family that's, you know, playing with a knife in the knife in the in the PowerPoint socket, then that parent is going to have to use some discipline as a yeah. level of love and protection. And so we get eventually after we resist and resist and resist, then the crisis moment will come and that's the shake up. But we don't need crisis because see what happens is as we start to wake up, we preempt because there's karma and kriya in Vedic philosophy. Karma is the, the corresponding reaction after the action. Kriya is the subtle sensation before the action that can guide you 
before the karmic action. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's that, that little subtle feeling in you that says this way or that way. And, and we get more and more in tune to that the more we wake up, which means we have less and less crisis. And that's why if we get more people on the planet waking up, we're going to have less crisis. Yeah. No, I love, I love your description, Tom. And in our day and age now, I believe we've forgotten how to feel. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're caught in our heads very much. Yeah. yeah, and then there are so many distractions now that can keep us completely distracted from looking at any of those things. And yeah. it just because it just it's so easy to 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 dismiss something and put it away until until it um, until it's ready to explode out of you. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I'm intrigued with the, the six people you had on the movie. How did they all view their own crisis looking back now with, I guess, life behind them? That's a really good question. Um, I think they see them all. I, mean, I, I, I can't say personally for them all, but I, I, my feeling is that they see them as I see mine as an essential part of your own evolution. And, and, you know, for me, I look at my crisis like, thank God that happened. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd still be a complete douchebag. <laughs> and I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not an enlightened monk and I still have flaws. Don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, I, I have, it has helped me grow. It has helped me grow. And, and how bad did it get for you, Tom? Because I know you were a broker in Sydney and you were living quite a a, uh, a drug fueled partying life at a young age and earning lots of money and mm. like how, how bad did it get for you to, to yeah it's you interesting it? you know I've, I've had since that one other crises along the way as well I mean you move through them quicker and you see them more consciously for what they mm. are but they don't actually stop Your challenges don't stop but for me at that point that was like a real fork in the road which defined my life as pre and post meditation um, and uh, you know, for me at that point, it was really severe, severe depression, uh, really okay. severe anxiety, severe panic attacks. Uh, I would definitely say suicidal tendencies because the pain was so immense that particularly the daily panic attacks, which would have me crippled in a ball and just really uh, wanting to do anything to get rid of those panic attacks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And how do you... And it's so hard, isn't it, when, you, when you're having those emotional and feeling experiences to get beyond those emotions, to see things with a different level of mind. You know, how, how do you see crisis these days? If, like you say, our problems never go away. It's just our skill sets improve to, to handle problems as they come, right? Yeah. I mean, how, how do you take that wisdom from your own life's experiences into something that might happen now? How do you look at them? Yeah, um, you know, we had some family issues uh, recently, some family challenges, um, you know, people getting sick and things. And um, You see the fragility and the vulnerability of life for what it is uh, with gratitude um, and recognise um, the impermanence of it. Um, and, and, you know, within that, you know, it's the deep respect and a love for it and the temporary nature of it uh, to know that there are people in your life and the experiences that are so temporary and so fleeting. So I think you have more gratitude, mm. um, more acceptance of, of the nature of life. Um, as Buddha says, you know, life is struggle and, um, and to have more compassion for it and for others that are struggling with it as well. You know, there's, there's not a person on the planet that you can't, you know, if you ask any of them, you know, is there a malady in your life? Is there a struggle in some way, shape or form? Is there a challenge? And, and I, I, there's not many people I'd imagine would be able to say no. Um, and so you start to realize that, um, wow, this is, you know, this is a, a beautiful, fragile experience that you, you tend to have more grace and compassion and love for, for humanity as a result of it. Yeah. Fair enough. It's um, yeah, it's interesting. I had um, uh, Dr. John Martini, mm. uh, Demartini, on uh, a few months back, and I asked him about trauma in his thoughts. and And his first reply was, "There is no trauma. It's only the meaning we associate to it." And it really made me contemplate that for a long time. Mm. But 
I know um, looking at this work, I would say that all my all the hardships and 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 things that come my way, there's always been a lesson there that I've been able to look upon back in time, and find, like you say, gratitude within that. Even though at the time it can feel like hell, and it could it could last for years. Yeah. Um. It's certainly yeah. It's certainly an interesting um interesting processes to go through. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I'm touching on De Martini because his work's helped me a lot through those times, um, which overlays okay. very nicely into Vedic philosophy, which is the, the permanence and unbounded and unmoved nature of self with a capital S, which is uh, when we say self with a capital S, we're talking about the, um, the divine nature that permeates and pervades all reality at the subtlest level of reality beyond form and phenomenon is, and some can call it love, some can call it divinity, some can call it being, some can call it um, self. Uh, but really there's this experience to be had as a, as a human, an awakened human, um, where we, tra- that's why transcending meditation is so important because you access that on a regular basis. Beyond the limitations of the forms and phenomenons of reality lies another reality which is a very subtle reality, which is just being itself, which is this presence or awareness. And it's a quiet watchfulness that isn't affected. It doesn't have emotions, doesn't have thoughts. It's not disturbed in any way, shape or form. And um, what we get in the world of forms of phenomenon is, is constant polarity, which is equal measures of support and challenge in each, each experience. So there's a dynamic in the relative field and the field of form and phenomenon, which is there's support and challenge in every moment. So whenever you're in crisis, there's, you'll be able to locate within that crisis and that challenge equal measures of support. But what we tend to do as humans, and this is the conundrum that we face, is that what we tend to do in our current reality, which is today, we look at our challenges, our maladies, our, our struggles. And what we see in the future generally is what we see is so we're only seeing the challenges we're not seeing the support like you know i've got an amazing wife got amazing kids got amazing house i live in amazing suburbs you know got uh, affluence that keeps me survived it's got fresh running water and all this support so much support in my life but we don't put our attention on that on a daily basis we just take it for granted what we look at in the future is a reality that where there's only support and no challenge if i can just get to Byron and buy this house and live on a farm and have this amazing experience my life's going to be incredible but we're not taking into account that there's going to be a challenge somewhere like your mother might get sick or, you know, you might have challenges in your relationship or you might have challenges in your finances or you're going to have some challenges in your work. Um, and we're not seeing that in our future. And what we're seeing in our present is just the challenges. And so there's this always a big separation between what we see to be a future reality and possibility to what currently is, which is actually the same equal cool. levels of support and challenge in both. Yeah. I love it. It, 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 it. It's almost like, and I, I often think about this when I catch myself daydreaming, fantasizing about this Nirvana future that's coming my way soon. Yeah. And then that, if that's the case, then I'm actually coming from a place of lack right now because that's then, right. yeah. then I'm automatically or subconsciously telling myself, well, I'm not fulfilled right now. I'm not happy. And it's only until that, am I then going to feel whole and complete? It's a function of the ego to think that somewhere, some, somewhere or some experience is going to provide fulfillment and mm-hmm. it's not, and, and the other, so that's one characteristic of the ego or, or um, you know, the, the, uh, the entity that's existing within you, the personality is that somewhere in the future, there's a reality that I can have an experience or form or phenomenon that's going to make my life better. And that this current reality, the second part to that, that, uh, that characteristic is that this reality is never going to be enough. Yeah. So that they're, they're two tr- traits of the, the ego that leaves us in a constant state of despair and discontent, which is why the shopping malls are full of people buying things. Um, <laughs> now what self itself has is its own experience or the divine or being or presence, which is us as well at the subtlest level beyond our thinking, feeling body is that it is complete. There's no hunger. There's no lack. There's no, it's not like the divine or God's going, if only I could get more. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, It just is. It just is. It's just amnes. It's just presence. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a fascinating topic. Um, Well, well, what do you do on a daily basis then, Tom, to, to keep yourself 
like a, like a, like appreciate, like you said, you're not walking around like a Buddhist monk and you know, mm-hmm. nothing phases you with stuff, tragedy, but what, what are your practices? What do you generally do to kind of, cause I look at it like flossing or brushing my teeth. Like there's almost this element, you just stay on top of it. Mm. Yeah. I have some go-tos um, on a daily and weekly basis that keep me grounded and um, vital. So I, I see it as a very holistic approach. You know, I, have to really have a deep respect and gratitude for my physical body. Um, it's such a gift to be given a, a physical body and experience this plane of earth. Um, and so I have to look after that in, in, with so much respect now, which I didn't used to. Hmm. So, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I, I do gym workout three times a week. I do yoga three times a week. Uh, I do a sauna sweat, you know, two, t- two or three times a week. Um, you know, I try to surf, which is getting less and less time while I'm doing the film. Um, and then, of course, my daily go-to, without doubt. I mean, I, I try to do at least one or two of those things each day. And then my meditation is my core, which is sitting. Um, and, and, you know, I'll sit and do mantra transcendent style meditation and then some, just some sitting itself, which is in silence. And then I'll do some visualization and gratitude. Yeah, beautiful. And um, what would you say to someone listening to this that might be in a bit of a crisis right now? that might be kind of reaching that pain point, but looking at these tools, this access, but haven't taken the first step. What would Mm. would you say to that person? The, the, The challenge we tend to face when we're in these moments is thinking that we need to, to run from it or do more or get more or get something or try and fix it. Okay. Um, and the thing that we're less inclined to do, but the most important thing to do is to go where that crisis is not. <clears throat> so we put a lot of our attention on the crisis and this is the problem, this is the problem, this is the problem, but we want to go where the crisis is not, which is stillness and silence. It's like if you think of a tornado and it's swirling around as mayhem and chaos um, in, the, in the outer regions of that tornado, but it, where the tornado is not is in the center of it. There's no tornado there. It's like there's silence and stillness. And that's what we want to start doing is we, we don't need to try and fix the problem. We don't need to try and resolve. We don't need to sit and talk for long hours about it. We don't need to take drugs to try and get rid of it. We go to where the crisis doesn't exist. And that's in the silence of being. And to do that, we can use a number of different devices. The one I'm skilled in in teaching is, is meditation, transcending style meditations that take us into transcendence beyond form now some people might say but isn't that running away well what it does is it allows you this the deep foundation and stability of your own conscious and knowingness and it gives you greater clarity greater wisdom greater um emotional stability to be able to move through that crisis and see that crisis for more of what it is rather than it, what we tend to do, want to do is move away from the pain of the crisis move away from the crisis but really when we find that inner stability and that inner silence and inner beingness, then we see the Christ for what it is. It's like, oh, this crisis is actually not a liability. This crisis is an asset. This crisis is waking me up. This crisis. And if we have the ability in that moment to have gratitude for the crisis, it melts. It melts. And the impact of the crisis suddenly just starts to melt away. Now, this is all very easy to say and do because I still get challenges and I still get disturbed and I still get ruffled emotionally by some circumstances in life. So I'm talking very idealistically and very, um, you know, long-term goal oriented, but starting that process, you know, when we had a major, major crisis in, in one stage of the film and I couldn't find my way through it, it was a deep, dark night of the soul for me. Um, but we had to pivot on the film. We'd spent a lot of money and it was a real crisis moment. And I knew that me trying to think my way out of this wasn't going to work. So let's just do what the film's about. Let's just meditate. And I meditate and meditate. I meditate my ass off. And, and interestingly, one night at two in the morning, I woke up because I was accessing more and more of the field of creative possibility, infinite possibility and infinite love an infinite wisdom and by immersing my my field of thought in that space more and more the solutions would come from that because all solutions to all problems lie in the field of possibility 
just as all creative designs, just like this mouse and my iPhone was all as a possible creative design at some point in the field of possibility. Um, and so at two in the morning, I woke up and all of the film just suddenly downloaded and I got out of my bed. It's still in my phone, in my notes. I, I wrote down this outline of what the, 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 the film will be. And that morning I woke, went back to sleep, woke up and pulled in the crew and said, this is what I think that the new film is. And everyone went, yeah, that's it. That's fantastic. Let's do it. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, amazing. It's like, uh, I'll think of it like there's a big database. And if, <laughs> yeah. you, uh, and if you get out of your own way and yeah. get out of those stress responses, and like you'd say, trying to solve it from the mind all the time. Um, Especially when you're stressed, because you, when you're stressed, you're, the functionality of your brain is so impaired. You know, you're oh. really coming from such limited brain f- functionality. It's from reptilian brain, you know, which is just fight or flight. And so mm-hmm. you, you don't have access to the that ironically you don't have access to the creative impulses that you need to get you through that crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I got to ask you before we move on as well, it's interesting everything you say there and what was, what was the language or what was the trigger point for you to get you into this work in the first place? That's I, a good question. I'm always fascinated to, by that. To, to get it means the work is in, is in teaching it or as in experiencing meditation. E- experiencing okay. it. Be- yeah. Well, look, I, I was in a dark place. I, I developed agoraphobia, anxiety, panic attacks, and depression. I'd been put on pharmaceutical drugs and was seeing psychologists and psychiatrists oh, wow. at that time as a broker at 29. Um, now, I, at 29, uh, you know, this was 1996, and there was no internet, no Foxtel, no Netflix, so I'm at home watching TV, and there was a, there was a documentary about a, a man called Bruno Grollo, who was a big property developer. And part of that story about his success uh, was that he, he meditated and I'd never really come across meditation. Didn't know anyone in my life that meditated and never really explored it at all. And he was sitting in a chair in a suit meditating and it was like an epiphany because, you know, I sit in chairs and I wear suits. So as a broker and it suddenly lit my mind up as to a field of possibility. And I got this incredible intrigue in my body, this curiosity, and that was the starting point. I literally went and got the Yellow Pages phone book. And I remember distinctly opening that up on the coffee table and looking up meditation in the Yellow Pages. For those people who have no idea what I'm talking about, the Yellow Pages was the phone directory <laughs> <laughs> before we got Google. And, um, you know, you had to look up the local centres that offered, you know, painting or plastering or plumbing. And I looked up M for meditation. And there was a list of six or seven meditation centres that I rang them up and went and spoke with them and that's when i found transcendental meditation wow yeah they, they always need a hook doesn't there yeah, like yeah, the, the, yeah. there's something relatable the catalyst. Yeah. yeah absolutely amazing um i ask everybody on the show a few questions mm-hmm. and um every week and my first one is to you what does your morning routine look like yeah it's a bit different at the moment because we're we're about to go to the u.s with a large distribution of the film and so a lot of our distributors are in uh, in the u.s our publicists in the u.s our social media teams in the u.s so i'm doing morning calls at the moment which is really disrupting my morning schedule because what i like to do is i like to get up and do something physical so that's a surf or a swim or a sauna or a workout or a yoga class i like to get up and burn off that cortisol that's been brewing through the night and ready to allow you to sow the field or collect the eggs or milk the cows or chop down the wood for the fire. Um, so we generally should wake up with a bit of burst of cortisol. Um, and then I like to burn that off with some physicality and then go and do some stillness, which is my meditation and then gratitude and some intention setting and then my breakfast. Um, so that's a little bit disrupted at the moment, um, but that will get back on once we pass the U S distribution. Yeah. Fair enough. If you could have dinner with anyone tonight from anywhere in the world, from any time frame. Who do you think it would be and why? Mm, wow, such a good question. Um, I'm not religious, but I really do and have a strong connection and, and admiration and curiosity for the man, Jesus. Uh, and, and I'd like to spend some time with that person. Um, and if he was busy because he was, uh, you know, on a Tinder date, then uh, I'd probably uh, like to sit with uh, someone like Ajashanti or Muji. Okay. Okay. And um, what's one thing about yourself most people wouldn't know? Hmm. Gosh, 
so many. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm still, uh, you know, I, I, I still, I still have fear, you know, this is one of the things that I still, you know, I, I know a lot of people see me, you know, on podcasts and retreats and teaching and think of, and I, and it's interesting because I, I'm starting to realize after spending a lot of time with very awakened people that they still have their own challenges and some traits that exist that contained within the ego. So I, I like to share and, and st- convey my humanity hmm. and, um, and, and, and not, uh, not portray a, a false sense of reality that, you know, all of us grapple with our own personal struggles, no matter, even the Dalai Lama, I'm sure has a lot of things on his plate, a lot of challenges. He's surrounded by 12 bodyguards. He's constantly under threat. He's got so many things on his schedule and um, there's no question. He has his own personal health issues. Um, you know, so we, we all, we all have our struggle and, and we're not exclusive of that. Yeah, totally. Um, what are your hopes for this movie? Um, the hope is that uh, a hundred million people get to watch it and B that it inspires some form of action. You know, it's not just an entertainment piece that then they go off and think about, let's go to the pub and get wasted. It's like, you know, it's, it's something to contemplate and discuss and share and, um, and then be inspired to go and meditate hopefully, because if, if nothing comes of it, then it kind of, <laughs> what was the point of it? Yeah, of <laughs> so course. getting people to meditate and become more conscious, more loving, more kind, more unified, then that enlightened planet will probably prevail. Yeah. Beautiful. And last question, Tom, with everything we've covered today, and we've, we've covered quite a few areas, actually, the time's mm-hmm, flow. Yeah. Um, what would you like to leave the listeners to ponder on, to take away? The one thing that really inspired me with this film, and it's actually the turning point in the trailer. So if everyone has, if anyone hasn't seen the trailer, you can watch it at entertheportal.com. Um, and it's when Dr. Julia Mosbridge says in the middle of the trailer, most people don't know that their inner world exists. And in Sanskrit, it's called Turiya, the fourth state. So our first three states are thinking state, our physical state, and our emotional state. So we have these devices or these uh, vehicles called a mind, a body, and an emotional state, a feeling body. But we have a fourth state, which most people are unaware of, the state of transcendence, the state of being, the state of presence. It's the unmoved. It's our invincibility. It's our unconditional love. It's the wisdom within us and it lies deep within us in the silence and stillness of being and whatever device you use to get there, use it. But we need to start realizing that that is part of who we are as well. Just as the wave is the ocean at all times, even though it can be very identified as the form of itself being the wave, but it actually is the vastness of the ocean. Yeah. Fantastic, Tom. And uh, if anyone wants to catch more, like uh, where, where can I send them? Um, to tomcronin.com mm-hmm. or entertheportal.com. Beautiful. And uh, you, you, the portal will be screaming, screening all around Australia over the next month or two, right? Yeah, we open on the 17th. We've got Q&As all next week in capital cities and we open nationally on the 17th of uh, October. If people can't see it in their local town, they can, um, or even anywhere in the world, they can actually host their own screenings. We've got hosts that are starting to screen in Kansas, in Ireland, in, gosh, Mexico, uh, r- urban regions, of rural regions of Australia. So it's, um, it will be in capital cities predominantly, but also... Uh, if someone wants to host it for their community, they can do that on our website. Beautiful, Tom. Um, look, thanks for coming on today, mate. And no, congr- congrats on a mammoth project. I fully appreciate everything mm-hmm. you're doing at the moment, mate. And uh, I just wish, wish you nothing but the best for it all. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. It's great to be here. And thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, Tom. Mm-hmm.